Uh, this is organized by the African Economic Research Consortium. We thank the uh, UN wider uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity. Uh, I just introduced uh, uh, presenters here. All of us are... Uh, uh, the first presentation will be by Professor Eric Torbeck. Uh, I just read out the title. It's on the interrelationships uh, between... Uh, yeah, uh, let me just grow inequality and poverty, some implications for fighting the COVID epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. It's pre-recorded. Uh, Lina, you can help us upload it so that it runs. Um, I want to welcome you from the uh, Redwoods of uh, California. It's very early in the morning here. And I'm very happy to be uh, uh, part of uh, this very important conference. So the uh, uh, topic, um, the theme of my uh, paper, my presentation is, as you can see from the uh, PowerPoint, the interrelationship between growth, inequality, and poverty. Um, and some implication for fighting the uh, COVID epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, let me give you some uh, background um, into uh, the uh, genesis of uh, uh, my uh, present uh, presentation. It builds upon a number of uh, earlier projects undertaken under the auspices of the African Economic Research Consortium. And more specifically, the most recent one, which is on re-examining the growth, poverty, inequality, and redistribution relationships in uh, Africa. Uh, about uh, 14 uh, individual research projects um, have uh, been completed on a competitive basis under this uh, uh, project. The uh, uh, novelty um, of the uh, uh, GIP program is to explore the reverse causality between poverty reduction and subsequent higher uh, growth. Uh, we all know from the literature that economic growth is very good for poverty reduction. It's a necessary condition. It has been uh, confirmed by a number of studies. But the reverse link from poverty reduction to subsequent uh, growth is still somewhat of a uh, conjecture. So um, if you look at the uh, uh, slide, uh, the, the link from uh, growth <clears throat> to poverty reduction, as I mentioned, is well known. And uh, the kind of strategy that economists have promoted is what we call a pro-poor growth strategy. The, the link between poverty reduction and growth, on the other hand, is uh, still to be confirmed, but I think we have plenty of evidence based on the studies in this project uh, that uh, um, a direct intervention on trying to reduce poverty is a good thing for uh, economic uh, growth. So now let me try to uh, bring out some of the implications um, of the findings of this project, uh, which may be relevant to uh, the fight against uh, uh, COVID-19 in uh, Africa. Um, the, the first point I would like to make is that the negative impact has not ba been as bad uh, in Africa as in other parts of the, uh, of the world. The latest statistics showed that the incidence of COVID was 10 times lower 
in Africa than in the USA and five, five times lower than in uh, Europe. Well, undoubtedly, there is a very large undercounting, but even taking that into account uh, means that uh, Africa has not been as badly affected by the uh, crisis. Uh, among the speculative mitigating factors are Africa's previous experience with outbreaks, um, masks have not been politicized, early shutdown, and demographics, which is very important. Uh, the, um, I think the average age uh, in Africa is something like 16 or 18. So we're dealing with very young people who are less susceptible. In the short run, there's of course a trade-off between uh, prioritizing uh, health and reducing transmission and the uh, consequent loss of economic welfare, which can be very hard on the uh, uh, poor. So um, what have we uh, uh, learned? I would submit that in the uh, medium to uh, long run, the successful containment has a positive effect on health and the economy and the trade-off tends to uh, uh, vanish. So those, and again, the evidence suggests that the African countries that prioritize the health of the population and the containment uh, were also uh, countries that uh, accepted a short-term negative economic trade-off, uh, which is going to pay off in the uh, long run. So what are the lessons that, uh, some of the lessons that we have learned from the uh, projects? Um, in order to answer this, I think we have to ask which households have been most negatively affected by uh, COVID-19 in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa? And the answer here is very straightforward. The unskilled, the less educated, the poor segment of the population who have very few uh, uh, assets except uh, labor were disproportionately hit by the uh, crisis, both health-wise and uh, economically. Since uh, most of the unskilled workers are employed in the uh, informal sectors, it makes sense to try gradually to nurture this sector so that uh, um, the uh, um, people in the informal sector are not really chased out of the uh, sector. Um, the second uh, um, implication is that um, while the COVID-19 is a real, real challenge, it could provide the impetus and the opportunity for a much more ambitious pan-African program of massive in infrastructure construction. The advantage of this is uh, such a project would require a lot of unskilled worker uh, to reduce transportation costs and promote intra-African trade. Um, another implication is that fiscal impoverishment should be avoided. Fiscal reforms are needed to make revenues and the expenditure pattern more uh, productive. And then also um, there's plenty of evidence that uh, subsidies to the poor in the form of uh, uh, nutrition, health, and education are crucial in reducing the inequality of opportunity and leveling the playing field. So these are the uh, my main comments, and I uh, thank you for having uh, listened to me, and I'm now going to have breakfast. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. I think this was uh, very crisp uh, and uh, um, um, highly uh, relevant uh, message that you have delivered, which actually follows nicely with the next paper, uh, 
uh, that uh, we all co-authored, myself, Juguna, and uh, Eric, uh, who pushed us to, to really investigate uh, exactly what he has said at the end of, uh, at the tail end of his presentation, which is um, uh, for African countries, uh, of course, uh, the uh, management of the COVID-19 has been painful in terms of uh, economic and social disruptions. Uh, but then uh, we, uh, it would be also uh, important to see if those policy responses have worked for Africa, if the empirical evidence supports uh, that the uh, uh, some countries who have done uh, uh, the, uh, applied the guidelines by the uh, WHO uh, fared better than those who did not in terms of preserving lives. So, uh, so uh, apologies for this. Uh, we are learning hop, hop in. Uh, it's a nice application. Um, so, in this, uh, I think, as I said, it's a, a bit of a continuation of what uh, Eric has said. This is a paper uh, by Juguna Dungu, myself, and uh, Eric, uh, uh, preserving lives or livelihoods. I mean, we are asking this question uh, because of the trade-off uh, he just mentioned earlier, uh, so that to assess the policy uh, responses in Africa. So uh, I will just go through the motivation, objectives, and data results. Uh, it's, it's going to be very quick. I think, as we all know, uh, at the onset last year of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, all countries have been advised by WHO to follow some guidelines uh, in order to contain the spread of the pandemic, at the same time also uh, preserve lives. We have all gone through that. And uh, I don't, I mean, no need to uh, indicate what has been done. Uh, a lot of uh, measures have been done by governments. Now the question, uh, some researchers are asking uh, for example, Asemoglu et al. Uh, just published in uh, the American Economic Review Insight, uh, and Alvarez and uh, also their uh, co-authors, uh, about whether uh, the, there could have been a possibility of uh, minimizing the loss function in both aspects. That means uh, minimizing the impact of the pandemic, at the same time also minimizing the spread of uh, the virus. So they have shown uh, through various models, uh, it is possible for government uh, to design and devise uh, a much more nimble uh, policy response than what has been uh, uh, suggested by WHO. When it comes to African countries, even the situation is dire because uh, a recent paper also Brown uh, Ravalin and others uh, published in the uh, NBR uh, suggested that for African countries, the WHO guidelines tend to be less transferable because most of those guidelines, uh, their application requires a setting that is more or less uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that exists in developed countries. Uh, social distancing, uh, people don't have enough rooms to share. so. If somebody is sick, you cannot isolate. Uh, many people don't have access to information, TV, tele, uh, etc. So, uh, with this in mind, we have asked ourselves uh, in this paper uh, how effective, anyway, the policy response have been, uh, particularly lockdowns and other preventive measures. And also, we uh, present in the paper the economic and social disruptions. And then we want to draw lessons on minimizing potential trade-offs. Um, I mean, why Africa? There's two things. One is uh, shock tend to persist. So economic and social shocks, uh, their economies are not as resilient as uh, foreign and developed countries. And the other one is the issues that uh, Eric mentioned in his presentation, uh, whether uh, African governments have the fiscal capacity and also the reform and the institutional ability to turn the COVID-19 from a challenge into opportunity. To assess uh, and answer those research questions, we have used extensively uh, novel data that's available 
uh, uh, in the open sources uh, on infection, daily infection rates, daily fatality rates, daily, daily confirmed COVID-19 cases. Uh, and then lockdown measures also we used uh, um, uh, as those reported by Google uh, for mobility of people uh, in all of the 54 African countries, a stringency index from Oxford University, uh, but also community understanding of the COVID-19. Uh, a lot of the indices have been developed by WHO and others, testing and tracing index, COVID-19 related daily violence. So we started to see the extent to which uh, all of this come together. Uh, so we have uh, applied uh, a simple empirical uh, model uh, that links the rate at which uh, the pandemic uh, spread or the fatality rates or even the decline in economic activity can be linked to the treatment variables. We call them those policy or treatment variables, uh, such as, for instance, stringency indices, change in mobility of people, testing and contact tracing, etc. So that we can pick the impact uh, easily using uh, internal instruments available because this is a daily data set. So you can imagine from uh, about uh, January 2020 up to uh, November uh, 2020, uh, 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 daily data for all of these variables. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, uh, we found, at least at a descriptive level, uh, stringency indices seem to be correlated with uh, actual compliance in terms of mobility of people uh, from their usual routine. Uh, so, however, at a higher level of stringency index, you see high variability, which means compliance is not, has not been perfect. But also, you could see uh, the pattern of the lockdown uh, between it started around March and what really is a median one uh, hit the bottom around May and then it started climbing up uh, as countries eased the mobility uh, and people started to come back to normal life. But then uh, the stringency index also uh, shows similar patterns. But generally, uh, this helps, this heterogeneity and variation helps us to capture uh, the impact. At a descriptive level, uh, you can see um, the average rate of growth in infection of the COVID-19 causing virus, uh, the uh, fatality rates, etc. All of this uh, uh, just give us uh, how huge variation it exists between countries. Uh, and the average more or less also complies with what we hear in the news uh, every day. The result, uh, I'm just showing the main result based on uh, uh, IV estimation uh, of GMM uh, for uh, a large number of African countries over this period. Uh, you can see, uh, I think, uh, clearly uh, our instrument, uh, the first stage regression I did not report, uh, but it's uh, quite significant showing the validity of the instruments. Uh, but also, uh, at least in terms of over-identification, it meets the criterion uh, that the excluded variables, uh, are, uh, we have done it uh, correctly. And the result, um, uh, let me read it out here. The result shows us reductions in mobility. That means actual mobility of people around the mean, which is minus 18% from the usual one could lead to daily uh, reductions in infection rates by 1% and fatality rates by about 0.6%. Uh, similarly, stringency index also led to significant reduction in infection rates. So basically lockdowns have worked in Africa even on the average. So countries that have implemented the lockdown strategies uh, uh, following the guidelines, uh, whether it is partial or complete, uh, uh, they have done quite well in terms of uh, 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 reducing the infection rates and also reducing fatality rates. However, uh, there has been also limits to the extent to which these have been effective. And we were able to identify even in this limited analysis that other factors than simply 
uh, lockdowns could be beneficial in terms of managing the pandemic. One of it is uh, the capacity of uh, uh, countries for testing and tracing. This you can see from the regression. It has had a very large and significant impact on uh, fatality rates, particularly. Uh, the community understanding. I think this is a very interesting also finding we have. Community understanding basically means uh, how much percentage of the population is aware of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also how it spreads and what are the protective measures and whether they believe in those protective measures. So there is an index um, capturing this and we were able to show that um, it's a non-linear one. That means if the population uh, that believes and uh, commits to protect themselves and their families uh, is within less than 20 percent, then it has no effect on uh, infection, actual infection rates rise. But as uh, the population becomes more and more aware, uh, which is above 20 percent, uh, we see a reduction in deadly infection rates uh, by 1.6 percent. However, all of these efforts uh, have come at a cost uh, for countries. We have also managed to look at the uh, real GDP growth effect uh, using nightlight data. Uh, thanks to TO for uh, accessing this data for us. Uh, it's a monthly um, uh, data. And we have tried to regress again the same uh, on uh, mobility because that is a good proxy for compliance. And after controlling for country fixed effects and also time during the period, uh, we've been able to uh, capture that there is a significant impact of lockdowns on the economy. So using some conversions uh, from the literature, uh, we can see that a one standard deviation decline in mobility could lead to 2% decline in real GDP growth. And lockdowns also affected social cohesion. Uh, we were able to document that the uh, daily uh, uh, average number of COVID-19 related violence generally tend to be very high uh, in countries that uh, um, uh, uh, implemented uh, uh, significant lockdowns. Now, what's the policy implication? The policy implication is we are not denying lockdowns have significant social and economic impact, but they succeeded in containing the spread of the pandemic. Now, in, in terms of uh, managing the balance, the trade-off between the two, um, some of the lessons for the policymakers is that uh, the, uh, uh, they could manage the spread of the virus through a wide range of tools available to them, while they continue also the economy to run. Uh, so there, there is a possibility for a smart policies. Uh, one of the examples uh, uh, even discussed today in another uh, conference was the role played by uh, digital finance, uh, where, for instance, people who do not have access to those uh, facilities were the first to suffer uh, from a loss of income, jobs, and also uh, livelihoods, basically, uh, going hungry. We have not shown here, but we have it in the paper, uh, all of those uh, impacts uh, on, on vulnerable households from high frequency phone service in 10 African countries. Uh, so basically, um, the message we have here is uh, the lockdowns have worked, but there was a limit to those uh, uh, effectiveness because they have come also at a higher cost. But there are also many other issues um, that countries can address uh, in order to make uh, the management of the pandemic easier uh, while also they uh, support uh, vulnerable groups. So this is uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Juguna and uh, Eric will come back uh, um, to, uh, yeah. So I'm done. So uh, the next presentation, uh, we go to Theo. I hope we... Uh... Thank you for organizing this session and uh, for, for the opportunity to present this, uh, this, um, this study. Um, it is still a, a work in progress, so 
your comments and uh, suggestions are very welcome. And um, the, the paper is about uh, monetary policy responses to the COVID-19 and the central bank independence in, um, in, in Africa. So um, the outline is that uh, you can see here, I go through the motivation, then I will present very uh, briefly um, what we call, I call here the conventional and non-conventional monetary policies response, and then the data, the empirical strategy and uh, preliminary results and uh, um, how we think we can, you know, conduct and dig further the, the, the study. And uh, so, well, um, what we, uh, we know so far about the economic crisis consecutive to the pandemic is that governments, you know, around the world are responding from all angles to the crisis. For example, the economic and social consequences of the lockdown, the sharp decrease in economic activity. Uh, this is just, you know, um, uh, what Abebe uh, mentioned. And, and um, uh, developed countries are, are relatively well equipped to address the issue compared to uh, developing countries. And in fact, many countries have limited resources and as you know, the technology to develop a vaccine, even to find the financial resources to buy vaccine uh, are not available. Uh, or even keeping some of this uh, vaccine at the required temperature is a huge challenge for some developing countries. So there is a limited uh, fiscal, you know, fiscal space for developing countries and particularly in Africa. And, uh, and uh, even before the crisis, what we know is that uh, the pre-pandemic, there is a pre-pandemic macroeconomic uh, instability. Uh, this figure that you can see shows some responses to uh, the COVID-19 in Africa compared to uh, other countries. And um, we can clearly see here that the rate cut, uh, which is the central bank policy rate cut after the crisis, in percentage uh, to the initial value before the crisis. And we also use the reserve requirement cut, uh, which is the change in the in reserve requirements in percentage of the initial value, and also the macro uh, financial, uh, which correspond to uh, measures undertaken by the monetary authorities from all aspects. Uh, the response in Africa is lower compared to the rest of, of the world. So, and uh, we know that monetary policy plays a key role uh, in such a context of crisis. And we lack a clear picture on how central bank across Africa has been handling the crisis. What determines the response and how central bank independence plays out. And, you know, although it is uh, one of uh, the government's most important economic tools, uh, most economists think that monetary policy is best conducted by a central bank that is independent uh, uh, of the elective, uh, elected government. So this belief uh, stems from research, as you know, uh, some years back, and uh, that emphasized the problem of time inconsistency. So in this paper, uh, we conduct a systematic review uh, uh, on all central bank policies in Africa after the COVID-19 outbreak, all the central bank policies in Africa. And then we investigate the size and the determinant of the response in Africa and uh, the potential role of uh, central bank independence in that context. And one of uh, the novelty of uh, this study is that we consider the timing, um, the central bank, uh, uh, you know, the timing uh, in central bank reaction, you know, to the crisis and the potential um, coordination issue across uh, central bank. So to give you a flavor of uh, preliminary results, 
what we find uh, is that central bank in Africa uh, have taken multiple measures uh, to tackle the pandemic and more than two thirds of central bank uh, have taken at least five measures. And uh, the other thing is that uh, these measures are similar across countries. And also both conventional and non-conventional policy tools have been used. And also African Central Bank responds less compared to the rest of the world in terms of uh, monetary uh, policy rate cuts and uh, also in terms of uh, celerity in the response. However, uh, in terms of reserve requirements, cut, African Central Bank reacts large. Uh, let me go quickly uh, through this uh, uh, monetary policy responses in Africa. Uh, just to give you a very brief description of these policies, this figure shows the number of monetary policy measures uh, by country. And uh, the, key, the key takeaway uh, here is that countries undertake at least five measures, most of countries at least, at least. And also regional central bank and North African central bank undertake more measures compared to others. For example, you see Morocco, Mauritius, Egypt, and they took 12 measures compared to uh, compared to um, uh, Eritrea, zero, and uh, Ghana, uh, very few, and um, uh, most of the BCAO, uh, uh, you know, uh, zone, uh, they took, let's say, yes, uh, seven measures and so on. So this is the key uh, takeaway from, from this uh, monetary policy responses. Uh, this figure also shows that uh, Two countries, Eritrea and Libya, for example, did not take any monetary uh, policy measures. And uh, again, most countries took five or more uh, measures. In terms of uh, celerity, uh, this figure shows the number, the average number of days between the first uh, case in the country and uh, the central bank reaction. Okay. What we can see here is that the average is higher for Africa, okay? So African countries, uh, they took uh, more than a week, more than a month, uh, sorry, more than a month to react compared to advanced economies and other uh, develop, developing countries. So having in mind uh, uh, this, uh, let me skip this. Uh, we have also classified, uh, we make a kind of typology of uh, the monetary policies and we classify them in terms of conventional and non-conventional, although the definition of conventional and non-conventional is something uh, I would say very um, uh, subtle. Okay. So we have, have this classification, which is one of, you know, um, the, uh, the contribution of, of this, uh, this description. So let me skip that one and move to, uh, to, 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 to this. So uh, having in mind that central bank uh, have been uh, doing, uh, uh, I mean, the question we, do, we did ask is, okay, what determine these policies? And we capture uh, this using um, a data. Uh, right now, we only have two waves of this data set and uh, with various uh, data sources. And uh, the first wave is from four, uh, February 2021st, and uh, the second is uh, from uh, uh, 7 May 2021. And uh, okay, we hope that uh, we will, uh, you know, complete the sample with uh, at least two or three others, you know, rounds of, uh, of data set. And then we have uh, 133, uh, 34 countries, and then to capture. Uh, we capture two dimensions of, uh, of monetary policy. The first is the size uh, of uh, the monetary stimulus, and the second is the celerity uh, in the response. So the size of the monetary stimulus is measured here by the central bank uh, policy rate cuts. 
and uh, the reserve requirements rate cuts, and also. Uh, a yeah, Tio, can, can you can you uh, try to go a bit faster? Uh, you have passed your nine minutes. Okay, so we also use the celerity of uh, of of uh, uh, as a, a measure of uh, monetary policy, and uh, and also a an index of, of this policy. So the uh, variable of interest that we use, the central bank independence, taken from this, uh, this guy, uh, a dummy of uh, Africa to capture, you know, what is specific to Africa and the interaction between Africa and uh, the dummy of Africa and the central bank uh, independence. We also control for some of the variables, the inflation uh, rates, the depth and the COVID-19 Studency Index and the exchange rates and the GDP growth for cost, you know, and, and, and yeah, yeah, okay. So let me skip the, so this is what we did. So we run this estimation, which is a, a preliminary uh, approach where the monetary policy is the dependent variable. And as I described, and we run this uh, regression. Okay. So uh, the results that uh, we get, uh, uh, is that when you look at these uh, estimations, okay, uh, the African Central Bank experienced less policy rate cuts compared to others, other countries, okay. And uh, the independence, independent central bank also no less rate cut compared to less independent ones. And the interaction terms here, as you can see, you know, uh, yes, it is a uh, positive and significant, meaning that the more independent the central bank is, the more it reacts. But when we introduce later on, you know, we increase uh, the controls in the regression, and we add, for example, you know, the exchange rate regimes, we lose the significance, which means that we suspect a kind of strong correlation between fixed exchange rate and the central bank uh, independence. Let me summarize now the other result that we get, and then I move to the conclusion. When we use the policy reserve government cuts, we observe that uh, reserve government cut is higher in Africa compared to other countries. However, the central bank independence is associated with less reserve government cuts. Also, that case uh, fatality rate affects significantly the policy reserve government cut. Now, what about the celerity? The celerity shows that Africa Central Bank were low, slow uh, in responding to the crisis compared to others, and that an increase in central bank independence tends to slow uh, the responses. And lastly, uh, when we run the regression on uh, African sample, what we get is that central bank monetary policy response in Africa is uh, mostly driven by the growth of costs and GDP per capita, and to some extent, the central bank independence. So as conclusion, uh, first, central bank react similarly in many ways to the pandemic. Second, uh, this preliminary uh, analysis shows that compared to the rest of the world, African central bank react less to the crisis. And finally, that central bank independence matter uh, in addressing uh, the crisis. So the way forward, what we do, as I think this is a study in, in progress, eh? okay? And um, we will continue updating the data set to include new versions, new waves, uh, about two to three, even four, if you're a bit lucky. We would love to have previous, you know, waves, but unfortunately, uh, the author of uh, the, the data, they just, you know, remove from the website uh, the previous waves of the data set. So we also intend to analyze and potential coordination uh, in central bank policy across Africa. So the question is, okay, monetary policy to do what, eh? okay? And, uh, and, uh, Yes, uh, one, we may think that uh, you know, the role of uh, this policy as any other policy is to, you know, cautioning the shock of the economic consequences of the pandemic. And then the question is, yeah. uh, has Geo, we... 
Yeah, can Chief, you just yeah. finish, Abebe? Thank you, thank you. I just finished. Yeah, uh, so, Tio has uh, taken too much of uh, your time, Chuku and uh, Alex. I don't know, uh, Lina. How how is it your timing? I mean, are we going to be banned? <laughs> uh, no, we're we're into we're past the the time, but we can still continue. But the main stage presentation has already begun, so some people may be moving over to that. Okay, so uh, the younger ones, Chuku and uh, Alexander, can you do it in six minutes? Uh, baby, yes, yes, I can. Like, we can do it in six minutes. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. Um, do you see my yeah. slides? Yeah, just click on your slide, I think. Yeah, it's coming. We are seeing it. I, I said full screen. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, no, Abebe, thank you. Um, thank you, ARC and Juguna. Thanks for this opportunity. Let, let me, because of the time we already have, we have a short period of time. This is a joint paper with Alex. You know, these are just thoughts. We have some working papers. Let me concentrate on showing a couple of um, what, what we'll consider some of the fascinating charts that might interest you. And um, this is in relation to, sorry, uh, this is in relation to, do my slides still appear, Claire? Yeah, the, we see it, uh, it's, but uh, you need to, uh, yeah. The, the problem is when I make it full screen, I don't see, I don't see you anymore. Okay, um, okay, let, let me concentrate on showing you just a few slides. And here we are concentrating on the macro environment. Um, the question we are asking is, what, what, what is the difference between a country that is more resistant to exogenous shocks and what helps countries to recover quickly from shocks. And if you look in the last 20 years, you see that African countries have been buffeted by several shocks. And here we just list six of them. The most recent one, the COVID-19, 2020 locust invasion in Eastern Africa, the 2014 commodity uh, price slump, the Great Recession, and there are several others, Ebola. And the consequence of these um, shocks have been very severe social and economic damage. And that's what you show um, uh, Eric and Abebe in your papers. And you know, in the African Economic Outlook, we estimate that Africa suffered the worst economic recession in half a century, lost GDP worth of 2.1 percentage points. The, the, the consequence is that you know, th this kind of shocks, exogenous shocks, leave deep scars in the continent. And this affects Africa's ability to achieve some of the ambitious you know, development projects, the AU's Agenda 2063, the Sustainable Development Goals, and several others. So policymakers need to learn how to build resistance and how to recover quickly from shocks. And, and that's what um, this paper is really all about. There are three main questions we ask. The first one, you can think of it from a normative perspective. What makes a country more resilient to shocks than others? Although, you know, this is more or less a normative question, we, we use data-driven uh, models to try to answer this question. The next exercise we do is we try to rank countries according to their capacity to absorb shocks and according to their speed to recover from shocks. Now, I think the, the interesting part is the question three, where we say, okay, after answering these two questions, it, it helps us to determine the exact entry points for resilience building and intervention in African countries, you know, in a country by country sense. Let me let me leave this part and just go to show you some of the interesting charts I talked about. So there are three things we'll talk about in the stylized facts here. Hysteresis, absorption, and rebound. Rebound here, you can think of rebound as recovery. Absorption is the ability of a country, it's, it's like the shock absorber you have in a car, the ability of an economy to absorb exogenous shocks. And we'll look at um, we'll look at the stylized facts. There's another point that I think is interesting. You might want to know. We, we also search for the so-called Singaporean paradox, and, and the idea is think about Singapore. You know, a small island country. In terms of its structural characteristics, it is vulnerable. It's far away from global markets. It's small. There are no natural resources. But in spite of this vulnerability, Singapore has managed to use homegrown economic policies to build resilience. So we'll look in the data and see if there are any African countries that, that are also experiencing this Singaporean paradox syndrome. So here, here we just show for first. Now, these are stylized characterization of what the impact of a shock could be on an economy and the possible paths for recovery.
for different accounts. I want to point you to panel B. If you look in panel B, here we call this negative hysteresis. This is a situation where a country is affected by shock. And then even after it has recovered after the shock, because policymakers are not able to respond you know, in the appropriate way, the future path of growth is, is lower than um, the previous path of growth. And this is what we are really looking for in panel D, what we call the bouncing forward, a situation where the country is affected by a shock, and then policymakers can reorient, reorganize the economy, to, the economy and use structural change and structural transformation to cause the economy to bounce forward to an even faster growth trajectory. So, so let's look at the data and see if we find evidence of this thing. Here we plot the chronology of Africa's business cycle for the past 22 years. If you look at this chart, what you observe is that Africa has experienced three main recession recovery episodes, cycles. The first one in the last 20 years is the global financial crisis. That was this 2014 commodity price slump and there's the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you look at these three episodes, you see they have different characteristics. Uh, you know, the depth, the, the duration of the, the recession and recovery are all different. But, and, and we discuss, you know, we try and characterize these different um, episodes in, in the paper. But here, th this one is, I think this one is um, also an interesting chart because what we do is plot all African countries and see if there's any synchronous movement in the way they respond to shocks, in the way they recover from shocks in the future. And we see that, yeah, there's some there's there's a high degree of synchronous movement, but there are a couple of you know outliers, exceptions. Look at Ethiopia, for example. The global financial crisis. Ethiopia was even growing. That's the yellow line. Was even growing faster, and I mean they had a slower growth just immediately after. Look at Rwanda. Rwanda has maintained a steady, you know, growth even during 2020. Um, growth rate in Uganda was still positive. Um, Zimbabwe is, is down here. It's a, an entirely different pattern we see for Zimbabwe. And we understand why there, there are a couple of other issues. So what we did is to look at the two most significant, you know, um, recession recovery cycles for Africa and try to characterize both of them. This was the global financial crisis. Here, what we do is to compute a, an absorption index and a recovery index. And we show, because of time, I, I won't discuss how, how we compute those. But we see that in, for the global financial crisis, the countries that had the strongest absorption capacity were the same countries that had the fastest speed of recovery. That's why you see this positive relationship between absorption and recovery. Now, fast forward to 12 years now, look at the 2020 COVID-19 crisis. And we see that that positive relationship has disappeared, has flattened. So here we don't see the countries that that are the most absorptive, that have the strongest absorption capacity, are not necessarily the ones that have recovered so far from the quarterly data we have seen uh, in, in the last few months. So the, 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 the summary, the takeaway from here is that country resilience capacity is not a fixed attribute. Policymakers should not think that because maybe Ethiopia or Rwanda was able to weather the global financial crisis in 2008, therefore, you know, they still have this, that, that strength and ability to weather the COVID-19 shocks, because shocks come in different character, character, with different characterizations and affect the economies differently. That's, that's one message we see from here. So resilience capacity is not static. It's not a static concept. It, it evolves with an economy's um, characteristics. And, and here, what I show in this chart, what we show is the so-called Singaporean paradox. I wanted to, I want to concentrate on two panels, two you know, uh, quadrants. Look at this quadrant this top right quadrant. This quadrant, we call it the homemade quadrant. Quadrant. This is the quadrant where you have countries with strong resilience and high vulnerability. In other words, these are countries that by their structural characteristics, they should be very vulnerable. And yet they've used economic policies to strengthen their resilience. And we have just a few countries in this category. We have Botswana, Rwanda, and Namibia. But in this subsequent uh, slide, uh, excuse me, quadrant, you have so many other countries, we call this the self-inflicted con um, countries, where they, they have access to global markets, they have access to natural resources, yet, because of the kind of policies they run, they become very vulnerable and less resilient to shocks. Um, let me spare you, because of time, um, some of the empirical, the details of the empirical strategy, but let me go straight to the result, because Alex will talk a little about, about that. And um, um, let me show you the results from what we do. But the objective of this empirical strategy 
was to estimate a dynamic business cycle model. And the idea is to be able to identify the most important factors that help a country to recover from a shock and the most important factors that help a country to absorb exogenous shocks. And here we have five different you know, uh, variables, which I'll talk about straight in the results. Now, here, here's an important uh, chart that I'd like to call your attention to. What we do here is to plot the contribution of factors to shock absorption. And what we find, so shock absorption capacity, um, what we find here is that the business environment is the most significant factor that determines a country's ability to absorb shocks. And, and credit market regulation, in other words, the freedom of uh, credit market is the, is the biggest shock amplifier for most African countries. That's what we find. Other factors that help countries to absorb shocks include the stability of government because then they're able to make good policies as, you know, uh, that, that are implementable. And for, for recovery, our results for recovery reinforce the Keynesian prescription that it is stimulative aggregate demand policies that help to accelerate recovery. So policy makers should concentrate on... If you could try to right, wrap up, huh? uh, Okay. Um, if you want to get have... some comments. Yeah. Okay. Okay, baby. I think that I just have one more slide after this one. So policymakers should focus on um, private consumption, you know, boosting private consumption to help to drive this recovery. Other things they can focus on include, you know, boosting exports and government consumption. But the things that slow down recovery include these ones you see on this side, um, you know, weak reserves, high debt levels and increased imports. Um, and so, so, so let's go to the takeaway before Alex tells us one word, maybe if you allow, maybe on debt. The main takeaway we have here is that there's, there's significant heterogeneity in Africa's capacity to absorb shocks and their resilience. But what we found from this study is that there, there are at least two important entry points for resilience enhancing interventions. So policymakers should focus on improving the business environment because this will help to facilitate agile reallocation of resources. And policymakers should also focus on stimulative aggregate demand measures, you know, boosting private consumption, spending more on, on firms and households, and this will help to, to accelerate the recovery. And um, Alex, do you want to say one word about, if Abebe will let, uh, about the, about debts, how debts can be used for it? For it? Yeah, Chuku, I think, you know, I don't think that we have uh, enough time to do that. So okay. Maybe, okay. I think okay. you can take time to, to, to conclude. Yeah, you know, to, yeah uh, Chuku, we get you. I, I, I know you have uh, good negotiation skills. <laughs> um, oh, but but you, you know, know I think uh, this, is, this is about it. Thanks, um, um, thank you. I wish we had more time because I have I questions for you, Abebe, and I have questions for for Theo too. Yeah, yeah but this is a very exciting papers, all of them. Uh, uh, Theo, uh, Chuku, uh, and uh, Eric, uh, and of course, I need also to say uh, our paper is good. So, no, uh, 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 Lina, how far can we go? Uh, we have uh, some participants here. Uh, I see uh, some of them have dropped, but... Uh, well, we, we, can, we still we, have some people watching you. You're welcome to yeah, continue. Okay, so we can, we can open the discussion. How, how, do, how do they make comments or questions? Um, the the Q&A has been open, but I don't see any questions in there. So we can ask okay. if anyone has a question, they can write it in the Q&A now and... Yeah. Um, Okay, so maybe Chuku, you, you say you have some questions. Oh, oh yes, uh, thank you, baby. Um, no, I, I, I was, um, you know, I, I was trying to tie the paper that moved from Eric's first uh, paper to, to your paper uh, with Njuguna and, um, and Eric together. The, the big question I have is, now you try to measure, you, you try to say something about the effectiveness of COVID-19 restrictions based on the stringency. And interestingly, we did something similar for, for the African Economic Outlook. And your conclusion is that you no know, lockdowns have been effective, although you try to nuance that. And my sense is that um, we should, I think it, it deserves more nuancing because when we compare, we did a similar thing, but with a, a slightly different approach. We used linear projection methods at the African Development Bank the, the last year. When we compare the effectiveness of lockdowns in Africa, versus what we see in Europe. We, we saw, for example, that the 
lockdowns were effective in reducing the spread of COVID-19 by around 0.4 percentage points in Europe. In Africa, we got something around 0.1 percentage points. And we also found that it's not all kinds of lockdowns that are effective. There were some, you know, we, we tried to disaggregate. Um, so in that sense, I will say that uh, our conclusion maybe should be targeted, you know, you were, you were referring to the Asimoglu paper because I think what they were saying is that is, okay, if you can target this instead of wholesome um, stringency um, imposition, you know, lockdowns, that that will help, you know, target the areas, target the groups uh, to, 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 to better achieve, to minimize the loss function from both livelihoods and lives. That, that was just the question I had that, do we need to, do we need to nuance that conclusion more about the effectiveness of lockdowns in Africa? Do we, do we need to say more about that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, uh, let's be honest. Um, uh, we have gone all of us through it. Uh, and and um, uh, the lockdown has had significant uh, disruptions in livelihoods. Uh, so the Asemoglu uh, and others are saying young people, for instance, who are in the labor market, but less also vulnerable to the disease, at least in terms of fatality, you know, they can recover quickly. It's, uh, it's much better to let them work while you protect uh, those who are vulnerable. Because you see, the vulnerability to the virus and to the disease is not the same across age groups and sex and other uh, conditions. Uh, so taking those factors into account and having a very resilient healthcare system and social protection programs, and also information and, and, and the testing, tracing, and uh, uh, what you call also isolation. I think countries can manage uh, things better. I mean, the examples they give in, uh, uh, in the health uh, community is that of uh, uh, Singapore and New Zealand. Uh, and and uh, if you look at their experience, they have not locked down that much, uh, at least, um, uh, but they have really used, uh, and Thailand as well, um, uh, from the SARS, the earlier SARS infection, they have learned how to uh, manage infectious diseases. So they have a very thorough system of uh, testing, uh, tracing, and isolating. And when, uh, when they see a flare-up, they know where to target the lockdown. So, so those are the lessons we are highlighting, but we are also providing the significant disruptions that has come to the economy. Uh, it, uh, those countries, for yeah. instance, that began the full lockdown, the uh, GDP loss is 5%. Actually, the, the night light data gives you a much more... Uh, uh, precise measure of the loss because it's uh, it's uh, uh, at least for African countries it serves well. Yeah. Maybe Juguna, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah uh, you're, you're right. Oh, sorry, uh, so, Eric. You want to say something? I have a word. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, the, the the word that I would uh, want to add is that uh, uh, lockdowns are that much more effective when they are complemented by a number of uh, policies that help the, uh, the most vulnerable segments of uh, society. So it can take a number of different forms. It could be uh, um, food subsidies, uh, it, it could be uh, um, clinics, uh, uh, f which are available for the uh, uh, for the poor, but the important point is that lockdowns, th just by themselves, are not sufficient. Uh, they can be greatly the, the effectiveness can be greatly reinforced by uh, uh, appropriate uh, complementary measures, and I think that's one of the findings of. Uh, um, the various uh, projects that have been uh, undertaken. Th th thank you, Eric. And um, I just wanted also to tell Shukukuku that uh, 
uh, even even you know lockdown i think as eric said if it's supplemented by targeted social protection program that would help but of course that was slow in terms of being implemented because most of the countries were suffering from uh, you know the erosion of the fiscal space but we have seen that so lockdowns and even the severity is sort of uh, very very location specific and i was actually telling a baby that if you look at our urban slums in African cities, and you, if you just were, had data just focus on them, you can get actually more, more disastrous results than uh, what we're getting at the national level. That is because we are not, for example, you can talk about, Eric has talked about food subsidy, but that depends very much in terms of you know who is um, and how many people are in those, uh, in those slum areas. And so it means that for me, what actually worked in some countries is a targeted social protection program. But then when we talk about lockdown, you know, it was, it was a combination of two things. One, in a particular area where you cannot leave a particular uh, radius of uh, uh, place. And the other one was hours of business. And so these this, this are quite pervasive in some of the areas, especially in Islam areas. I don't know, uh, Vio has left and I wanted to tell him that maybe we should also have looked at it in terms of uh, some, some central banks perhaps used, because they could not actually roll up interest rates. Uh, what they did was also to use for uh, defend the, the, the nominal exchange rate. And some of them actually tried to uh, prime, uh, use their reserves to protect the exchange rate in terms of movements. Then we can look at that in terms of two aspects. One of them is um, what was that ejecting liquidity and what was the effect? The other one was in the early years, in the early months of uh, the pandemic, some, some central banks used their synergy revenue to pass on to the government. Maybe that had an effect of trying to accelerate or maybe try to cushion the liquidity shortfall, but something that we can do some testing on. Thank you. Oh. No, no. <laughs> okay, sorry, I think uh, uh, Theo uh, may have been disconnected somehow. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I saw he dropped off, but we are going to discuss this. But these are very exciting papers. I like the Chuku Chuku, your, your presentations and your papers with Alex. This is quite exciting. And because we're going, we, we, we actually may revisit and uh, see what um, you there's a, an area where you talked about coordination. But also, we may also look at um, somehow the initial conditions, uh, and that is very good in terms of looking at that because the coordination failure was quite, uh, it's very important at the, that level. It may be something that we can revisit once we come with the tangible uh, results. That is very good, present. that's very innovative presentation, and uh, it has nice um, um, things to look at. It shows that we can learn some lessons from previous shocks, for example, the global financial crisis. And the global financial crisis had targeted financial sector, but then it had a period. But that, this one is actually targeting from uh, the, the economy from not only the supply side, but also the demand side. And we can actually see what exactly happened. It's just like I was telling a baby that even when they are all down, there was some indigenous problem when you have a, a, back, a back crash on um, Suppose your neighbor dies of COVID. You, you don't react the same in terms of opposing the, the lockdown or even adhering the, 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 the business tracing. You actually become more active in, in, term, in terms of uh, precautions. So there are some endogenous measures that we may look for. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, uh, you were turned off uh, the I was talking about, you may look at the exchange the channel, one, to provide liquidity, uh, uh, because in some countries, and I saw that in Kenya, but on the other hand, they, they, they were trying also to protect the, no, the nominal exchange rate. And you can see that, um, that, that that works in a perverse way because it actually uh, uh, destroys the basis of monetary policy because if you let the nominal exchange rate become the automatic stabilizer or automatic uh, uh, stabilizer. But that, the moment you defend it, then obviously other, everything else does, doesn't go well. But it's something that we can try to, to see how it works through the through the, the, the equation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so so uh, I, I think uh, we have had a very uh, productive uh, discussion. Uh, Lina, do we have any questions from the audience? Or... 
Um, I see that there is one question in the Q&A uh, that says, did the hot weather in Africa contribute to the results? Uh, come again, Dina. Did the hot weather in Africa contribute to the results? I'm not sure which presentation they are refer referencing. Yeah, here, it, but... could, it could be about the infection uh, or about Chuku. Um, I think if it's uh, um, uh, on on the path of uh, infection, uh, probably. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, uh, scientists um, say, you know, uh, the temperature in Africa may have been uh, somehow a blessing, but I don't know. There is uh, so much controversy uh, about it. Uh, but I, I believe uh, there is some evidence to suggest that uh, when it is warmer, uh, the virus doesn't like it. Uh, so it, it, it can be, uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, but uh, if it comes to, to the point of Chuko, I think I, I like the um, uh, the typology you have done in terms of the shocks um, and the recovery paths that have been followed by different countries. Um, it's a very interesting finding and, and the factors also that seem to uh, stem uh, the shock and the factors that seem to accelerate recovery are the usual suspects. Uh, that means business environment, etc., and all of those institutions, um, which means this is a time for African countries also to think very hard that uh, if they want to survive another wave of shocks, they have to pick up uh, uh, reforms that they have uh, neglected for a long time. So I think it's a, it's a very strong message. Uh, otherwise, you know, the shock could be permanent, as you have shown in uh, in the simulation. But uh, Abebe, I think I can add to that and um, see that you look at the most of the focus on the, the waves, the, yes. the, the severity of the waves. And uh, like in Kenya, we were going to the fourth wave. It was actually consistent with the weather changes when it was yes, getting yes. in Nairobi. It was very consistent with the weather changes. What we don't know, and uh, Chuku may tell us, is that, for example, in warmer uh, coastal areas where the, the, the changing uh, temperatures are not very significant, did that have any effect? Because here we are looking, we're looking at the average results, but you can see that the, the focus that was, was being done by the, the medical practitioners was actually consistent with when it turns cold, not when it turns warm. I don't know how, whether that is a correlation, but that is the way it, it appeared. How was it in Abidjan? No, I think Abidjan was the most successful. I mean, uh, the country was free most of the time. There was never a lockdown. And yet, the rates were very low. But you know, Ab Abidjan has a very humid weather. Abebe, Abebe didn't really like that weather. Anytime I walked his office, he's like, oh, Abidjan is so humid. So, so you, I think I agree with you that whether, um, I think the question is more related to your work, you know, Abebe and Juvena and Eric, because the science shows that, uh, you know, weather affects the spread of the virus. And what I've seen in many papers, some of the ones you refer to, is that they control for the weather, uh, you know, they have this daily weather, because the stringency is a, is a very high frequency, I think it's a daily frequency. Yeah, yeah. So they, they control for the weather um, at different times, and they show that, Although now, can we really claim that? Because I mean, in North Africa, North America, we're in the summer, and yet, you know, you have increased rates of the of the spread of the Delta variant. So that science about the, the strong correlation between weather may be breaking. But I think it's a, it's definitely an important point um, to consider. Thank you so much, um, uh, Lina. Maybe we have really. Uh, done quite well uh maybe yes. we just uh we just uh thank wider uh, for the opportunity and uh uh yeah let's uh, give a round of applause i think we have had quite uh, a good audience about 40 at the beginning of uh, the meeting uh that is uh, wonderful for a parallel session uh, really, Tio, uh, Chuku, uh, thanks for the excellent papers, and uh, uh, you have made ARC proud. 
I'm a son of ARC. Ask the Thank you, everybody. Yes, yeah. true, I know that. So thank you very much, and thank you, Eric, for this uh, good presentation. But, uh, yeah, we hope to see you in ARC sessions. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you much. and uh, thanks, thank Nina, you, for all your help. Thanks, Eric. I hope uh, it, it it was uh, worth it. It, it was a very good session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much and have a good day.